Uh, I want to invite you uh, to reach and grab your copy of God's Word or your smart device or uh, a Bible there uh, on the uh, aisle in front of you and turn back with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you happen to uh, be joining us online, welcome. Uh, If you happen to be joining us here for the first time, we've been in the middle of a series uh, entitled God, Love, and Duct Tape. And if you missed the first couple of parts, you can go find those that are online. Uh, But in week one, we really looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, the first three verses. We really talked about our relationship with God and learning to love others. If we know the first and the second greatest commandment, Jesus said you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two commands, stand and rest the whole law. Now, in week one, we looked at those first three verses where Paul says, listen, it really doesn't matter how much you know about God's Word, about the Bible, or about the church. If if you know all of those things, but you don't have love, it amounts to nothing. He said, it doesn't matter how much you say or what you say. It doesn't matter if you can uh, quote Bible verse or you can speak to people God's will and God's way, but if you do it without love, it amounts to nothing. He says, listen, it really doesn't matter uh, how much you give. He says, if you give all your money to the poor to feed the poor, but you do it without love, it amounts to nothing. He says, listen, even if you give your body over to be burned for your faith at the stake, Paul says, if you do it without love, it amounts to nothing. So that's what we looked at in week one. If you missed that, you can go find that sermon online. Last week, we looked at the idea of taking the love that we have for other people and how we can take some duct tape in a broken world and bind up someone who is broken. Bind up someone's heart, encourage them along their way. And I used really uh, one illustration that Jesus told, really kind of challenging the Pharisees from Luke chapter 10, where Jesus used those words, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And immediately the Pharisee wanted to limit those he had to show it love to. And so he asked, who's my neighbor? He asked that question. As a result, Jesus responded by telling that story that most of us know about the Good Samaritan. And it was really a story about a man who was journeying along the road, got attacked by robbers, beaten half dead, had everything he had stolen from him, just laying on the side of the road. And the first person that passed by was a priest, a religious leader of the day. And instead of stopping to render aid, he moved on the other side of the road and passed on by. Along came a Levite, and really priest came from the tribe of Levi. Levi, when he came along and he saw that, that uh, man that was half dead and beaten and broken and been robbed on the side of the road, he too went on the other side. But it was the Good Samaritan that came along. Now, in those days, uh, uh, the Good Samaritans were considered the broken people, the people that were sinful people. They, uh, they weren't that strong in their faith. They didn't worship fully uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They just didn't do it. And they were considered criminals and lawless. But that Good Samaritan stopped rendered aid, bound up the man's wounds, took him to an inn, and paid for him. And so last week, we looked at the idea of how do I care, how do I become the duct tape in the lives of people around me who are broken? Today, I want to journey back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and talk to you about probably a more difficult topic. I will just share with you right now. What I'm going to share with you today is a hard topic. And if you have to do it, it's even harder still. It's even hard if you receive and you are on the receiving end of a message like this. And the message today is entitled, How to Confront Someone You Love in Love. How to Confront Someone You Love in Love. Now, what I, what I want you to know this is we, as we're thinking through this, uh, there is no such spiritual gift as confrontation. All right? There is no one that God has gifted you the ability or the authority to walk through the church or walk through your office and just scoop people up and bop them on the head. All right? That is not a spiritual gift. I want you to know that. And if you think it is your spiritual gift, you are sorely mistaken. I also want you to know to lovingly confront someone you love, it's not easy. 
It is a skill you have to learn. It is a skill you have to prepare for. I want you to know to do what I'm talking about today is not a drive-by conversation. It is not a microwave discussion. It is something that you need to pray about and plan and prepare and even write down what you think you need to say. I also want you to know this is risky business. Going to confront someone you love in love is risky business. I want you to know that. And I'm not talking about Tom Cruise socks and a, and, and a dance. I am talking about it's risky. Because if you go confront someone you love in love, there is the possibility that they reject you. There is the possibility it could end your relationship. And you need to be well aware of this. And so you need to weigh in the balance. The, uh, the behavior they're involved in, the stuff that they are doing, the direction they are heading, if I let them keep going that way, is it going to destroy them, my relationship with them, or others around them? Do you understand? I need to ask, is this that big of a deal? Oh, here's the point. Ladies, this is not the message on how you finally get your husband to pick his underwear up off the bathroom floor. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not where you, you go in and you approach him and say, in Jesus' name, the pastor said, pick up thy underwear. All right? That is not what I am talking about. Guys, th this is not the conversation that I'm talking about for you to improve your wife's cooking. All right? That is not what today's message is about. This is a weighty matter. This is a significant matter. This is me in love confronting someone that I love dearly and deeply. And I feel like if I let them head that direction in that way and that fashion, they're either going to run themselves off a cliff, they're going to destroy others around them, or they're going to destroy their relationship with me. So I want you to know this is probably not going to be the message that while you're taking notes, you're, you're making a list and thinking this is going to be a good week because I am about to light some folks up. That is not what I'm talking here. I am talking about when you think about doing this to an individual to confront someone you love in love, it turns your stomach inside out. Just the thought of it. It puts sweat on your brow. It begins to make your palms sweat. It begins to make you anxious and worried and keeps you up at night. And you are weighing out the decision, do I say something or not? That's the kind of message that I'm preaching for you today. And hopefully these are some points here that will help you if there is someone in your life that you need to go speak to now. I am also very well aware that when I preach a message like this as a pastor, that this message could prompt someone to come to you. Might be your husband, might be your wife, might be you going to your kids. I want to encourage you with this. If someone you love comes to you in love, don't react before you think. Remember that they have probably been eaten alive with this for a season. They are coming to you longing and desiring to make sure that you don't destroy yourself, that you don't destroy others around you, and you don't destroy perhaps your marriage or your relationship. So there could be two ends of the spectrum in here. There might be a husband or wife here that is thinking, I've got to say something because she's going to destroy herself or he's going to destroy himself. There might be a husband or a wife here that ends up receiving the message from someone that loves you because you are about to destroy yourself or your family or your kids or even your career. So regardless if perhaps this prompts, and I want you to know this preaching this kind of message is the kind of message I'd rather not preach. I'll just be honest with you. 
this is the kind of message I'd rather not preach. Because I know that there are some here that you know you have to do this. That you have to. And I also know as a pastor that when you go and confront someone or someone comes and confronts you, not everybody says, thank you. I really just needed you to point that out for me. I know sometimes it can drive them away, but here's what I want you to know. If we are talking about a significant point, a significant behavior, and you keep stuffing your emotions and your feelings, and guess what? It pressurizes and pressurizes, and it's in your marriage, or it's in your relationship with your kids. or this. What happens when you pressurize and pressurize and pressurize something? Eventually, it's... <laughs> Confronting someone in love allows you to release the pressure, hopefully in a loving... We're going to look at some principles and some thoughts today. A lovingly gracious and tactful way. Sometimes when you pressurize and pressurize and pressurize and pressurize, it doesn't explode, but what happens? The container begins to expand. What do you do? You put distance between you and your husband or distance between you and your kids or distance between you and your mate. And pretty soon, because you haven't been willing to, in love, confront someone you love, you look up and emotionally and relationally, you're as far from here to there because you've held it all in. And so regardless of what end of the spectrum you think you're about to be on this week, I want to let you know this is not lighty stuff. This isn't a small thing. This isn't a drive-by casual conversation. This isn't something that you just approach without bathing it in prayer and preparing what you are going to say. So let's look back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's dive back in and look here. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, love is patient and love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag and it is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly and it does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong that is suffered. Love does not rejoice in righteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, God's love, never fails. And then notice what it says. Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, if you look at some of those verses, like verse 4 and uh, 5 and 6, it says, listen, I don't need to live a life where I'm constantly keeping count of a wrong that is suffered. I need to live my life where my heart is a whiteboard. And man, a mark of sin or pain or bitterness comes my way. I'm constantly in grace mode, letting love overwhelm it, letting God's grace cause me to forgive. But there's also a reality of a situation that if someone continues to hurt me and hurt themselves and harm them and harm their friends and destroy uh, perhaps their career and their life because something in their life is out of control, the loving thing to do is not to ignore it. I have to come and I have to speak to them. And again, I want to share this with you. The relationship I'm talking about with you to go and confront someone you love in love, if you lost that relationship, it would devastate you. Let me put this another way. If you confront someone this week because of this message and it destroys your relationship and you don't care, you don't need to be confronting them in love because you didn't love them to begin with. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a significant relationship that you're going to go and you're going to communicate with someone because you care about them, you care about those around them, and you care about your personal relationship with them. Let me give you a couple of opening thoughts as, before I give you six quick ideas on confronting someone you love and you love. Number one is this. Confront others you love about behaviors, not motives. 
Confront someone you love about behaviors and not motives. I can't see your motives. You can't see my motives. All I can confront you about or talk to you about or see are the behaviors. Now, I don't know what the motive is, so I don't want to go and say, you know what, I know what you're trying to do. See, that's talking about motives. I can't see motives. What they are doing, I can talk about. You know what? I noticed this, and I noticed this, and, and you did this, and you said this, and you keep saying this, and here are the results of what happens. You have a relationship, you have a buddy, you destroy it. You have a friend, you have this, and you destroy it. Or, man, you constantly come home, and you attack me, and you take this out, and I want you to know how I respond when you say those words to me. It causes me to either explode or withdraw, and that's not healthy. So I want to make sure that when I confront someone I love in love, I'm confronting them about bad behaviors and not motives. What are they doing? I can't judge motives. Here's the next thought. Make sure you put the problem in proper perspective. Make sure that you put the problem in proper perspective. In other words, don't go make mountains out of molehills. Put it in perspective. In the grand scheme of things, ladies, if the worst thing your husband ever does is leave the underwear on the floor in the bathroom, you are in a good spot. How many of you know what I'm talking about, ladies? Guys, if the worst thing that ever happens in your relationship is is your wife burns a meal from time to time, you're in a good place. So I want you to know, don't make mountains out of molehills. When it comes to your marriage, when it comes to your relationship with someone you love, there are a few things in marriage that are mountains. I want you to know that. An inappropriate relationship, affair, abuse, addiction, there are just, the list could go on and on. Those are mountaintop behaviors and problems that have to be confronted Also, when you put it in proper perspective, was this a one-time act or habitual action? Man, did, 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 did you just walk in, guys, and all of a sudden she just lit you up verbally? Then you probably don't need to sit her down if that's the only time she'd done it or the first time you'd for a 30 minute conversation about her behavior last night when she was frustrated. That's probably one of those times where you just, I'm gonna forget about it. They had a bad day. Now, if there's physical abuse involved, might need to sit down and say, listen, you know what? This happened, and it's, it's never going to happen again because I'll tell you, if it happens again, here's what's going to happen to us, and, it's, and you just keep going down that road. Let me give you a couple of thoughts from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Here, here it's, here's what Paul says. Paul was talking to some friends in the Ephesian church. He said this, instead, speaking the truth in love. Now, a lot of people, and a lot of people in church, they kind of brag. They kind of of throw this phrase out flippantly. They said, you know, all I do is just speak the truth in love. You know, God's just gifted me with the ability to speak the truth in love. It's pretty much everybody I talk to. You know what that tells me? You probably don't have a good relationship with many people. Because let me tell you what, if you understand the depths of what is being said here, To honestly confront someone you love in love. See, because you can't state the first half of that verse without looking at the result that should take place because of the fact that you spoke to someone in love. Notice what it says. He says, instead, speak the truth in love so we will grow to become in every respect more mature in our body and our relationship of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Why do I go someone and go to someone and speak to them and confront someone I love in love is so what? Our relationship will mature and become closer to becoming more and more of a Christ-like example that we're all supposed to be as salt and light. What did Solomon say in Proverbs chapter 27? He says, wounds from a, hit, from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Here's the point in this. Is if someone comes to you this week, or next week, or three weeks from now, or a month from now, and they set you down, and they have a hard conversation through tears and weeping with you, 
You need to ask yourself, is this person a friend of mine? Do they love me? And if they do, you ought to suppress your natural response, which is to what? React. Just do everything you can, guys, to put your mouth, just close it, and put your ears in listening mode, and just say, let me hear her out. Ladies, let me hear him out. Let me hear my friend out. So don't overcomplicate this idea in this thought. So let me give you a couple of thoughts. I want to give you six thoughts today on when confronting someone in love. Let me give you six thoughts. Are you ready? Here's thought number one. Examine your own behavior first. Before you ever go and confront someone you love in love, you step back and examine your own heart and your own life and your own behavior first. Ask yourself, am I doing things that are also possibly making this happen? Now, I'm not talking about moving into victim mode or a codependent mode where, you know, man, he, I caused this and he responded that and, you know, you're just making excuses for bad behavior. I'm talking about honestly evaluate your own lives and your own self. You know, we, we have a couple of great examples in Scripture. Boy, Jesus and Paul were good at confronting people. Now, I want you to know it didn't always turn out well, but they were good at it. A lot of people think that Jesus was just a loving, emotional sap that everybody could just walk over. I want you to know, that wasn't who Jesus was. You look through the words of Scripture time and time again. Jesus confronted people. He said no to this and no to that. Remember when the Pharisees brought the woman who was caught in adultery and they threw them down at Jesus' feet? Why? Because they wanted to point out her sin to build themselves up. They didn't want to examine their own heart. What did Jesus do? He chastised them. If you look, the uh, video that we've shown the last couple of weeks, uh, that uh, duct tape uh, heart is back there. Yesterday, we had a big rethink conference, which is really training students to defend their faith, but defend their faith in love, to be gracious and loving. Now, they don't have any. Many of them were from other places and other churches and other stations around, even from Arkansas, Oklahoma, whatever. And many of the kids would stop because they would notice that heart, and they would take that, their picture next to that heart. Because part of the idea and the theme this week was being strong in your faith, defending your faith, but being strong in love as well. And so if you're going to confront someone in love, you've got to be strong, but you've got to be loving. The first way to be loving is to examine your own life first. What does it say in Matthew chapter 7? Notice what Jesus said. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that was in your own eye? He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? He says, you hypocrite. That's pretty confrontational. How many would say that if I called you a hypocrite today in the wall, that would be pretty confrontational? So Jesus is confronting the Pharisees about an ongoing, arrogant, prideful, and sinful behavior. What is Jesus saying when he's comparing the plank and the speck? He's saying, you Pharisees, you love to tear others down to make you look better. So I want you to know, when I confront someone in love, who I love, I am not trying to tear them down so I'll look better. I'm trying to encourage them and restore them. So let's read on. He said, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, examine your own life first, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now let me just stop you here and let you know, Jesus wasn't saying don't ever judge. You've heard heard the statement as you continue to read on. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. And I will tell you, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of people who will throw that in your face to justify their sinful behavior. When Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged, Jesus was saying, listen, before you go and rightly judge someone else, judge your own heart first. 
If I smoke eight packs of cigarettes a day, I don't need to get, you, get on you about the three beers you drank. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, when we thought, thought about this, or you think about this, a plank and a speck, how many of you, if you had a plank in your eye, you would like to get it out quickly? Okay, that, that makes total sense. Let me just be real and look at Jesus' analogy. How big a speck has to be in your eye before you want it out? Like one grain of sand. How many of you know what I mean? Anybody ever done this? You've been out mowing guys and you get something in your eye and you do this. And what do we do? We usually come in, we call our wife over there and go, man, you see anything in my eye? You see, it's, it's a brick. It's got to be a brick. It's heavy. And have you ever done this? She goes, I don't see anything. How can you not see it? I mean, it's, it's in my eye and you're doing all this and you're looking crazy. Why? Because it doesn't matter how small it is. If it's in your eye, it needs to go away. If you don't, it'll begin to irritate. It'll, it'll hurt. It will cause an infection. It'll destroy your eye. So I want you to know, Jesus wasn't saying specks don't need to be removed. But what he was saying is don't go try to remove someone else's speck in their eye before you've done your own examination on your own life. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Notice what the writer of the book of Hebrews said. He said, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble that would defile many. Hey, there might be some here today that you think, you know, I need to say something to so-and-so and I need, they just keep hammering me. They keep hurting me. They keep, they keep causing pain in my life. And I want you to know if this is you, the first thing you might need to deal with in your life before you go have that hard conversation with someone you love is the bitterness. Because let me tell you what, if they've sinned and they've sinned and they've hurt you and they've hurt you and you are just mad as all get out and you go in and you attack them out of the root of the bitterness, it will defile many and it will devolve quickly. So I want you to know, you don't confront someone just because you're bitter, because you're angry, or because you're mad. You do it because you love them. And you want to keep them from destroying themselves or the relationship with you or the relationship they have with others. Here's a second thought on confronting someone you love in love. And here it is. You ready? Make sure your motives are pure. Make sure your motives are pure. That's what Jesus kept attacking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders about the day because their motives in pointing out other people's sins were to prop themselves up, were to make themselves look, look better. Man, I just made a list of a, of a couple of things. What are some wrong motives you might go? Uh, sometimes we get jealous of people. It just seems like they have everything and everything seems to come their way. It seems like the sun always shines on their faith, face and they always get the promotion and they got the nice car and they got this and, they, and I'm just jealous. So if I can find a speck in their life, I want to go take them down a notch. That is a wrong motive to go and confront someone in love that you love. Uh, insecurity. If I'm insecure about my own life and, and they're very secure about their life, I don't want to go attack someone and confront someone because they are just going for it. And if you've been around here uh, enough, uh, uh, you know, as your pastor, I am always telling you, go for it. Man, whatever God has played, you go for it. You make it happen, whether it's in business or career or life, or, you go for it. God's way. And make it, but I want you to know, man, don't, don't, don't attack someone out of insecurity or don't attack someone out of anger. That's kind of the bitter. Man, if I am just fired up, what I'm talking about, the confrontation, the loving confrontation I'm talking about is not the conversation that starts with, I've had enough. Let's get it on. That's not the way this happens, that I am just angry and mad because I will tell you, you go at them angry, you are going to receive anger in return. Frustration. You don't go attack someone just because they're frustrated. You don't, this is not your license to get even. I want you to know, this is not your license to get even. To go back there and just say, man, I, I'm going I'm to level the playing field to feel superior. You're not to go and expose all of their sins so you can feel superior to them and say, yeah, but I haven't done this, have I? 
Another reason is, man, just to relieve irritation. And you just annoy the heck out of me. I want you to know. How many of you know, know people? You could probably point to a couple in here of people that annoy you. And there are people all over that irritate us. And ladies, I know that your husbands irritate you. I read your prayer request that you put in here. <laughs> but I do want to applaud you for staying anonymous because when your husband writes about your problems, he signs them. <laughs> so good luck this week. Is all I want to say. Notice what Scripture says as we think about making sure our motives are pure. What is a pure motive? When I want to help and not hurt, when I want to show love. Look at it, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, 12, verse 19. He says, we've been speaking to you in the sight of God as those in Christ, and everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. A right motive is to help and not hurt. To warn and encourage like someone who loves a child who says no. Here's a second thought. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. He says what? I don't want to go all willy-nilly. I don't want to go impulsive. I don't want to, I don't want to just go and, and just let words flow out of my mouth. Notice what Paul says. He says, for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and through and with many tears. Now, let me explain the first part of that verse before we move to the next part of that verse. Here's what Paul is saying, and if you don't know the context, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to a church that was blessed. They had powerful people. They had wealthy people. They had people with all kinds of gifts of leadership and skills and preaching and administration, man, and the gift of generosity, all kinds of amazing gifts. But they were a mess they had divisions and divisiveness. They had a free-flowing immorality throughout the congregation and in the congregation. And so when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 1, he wrote much of 1 Corinthians 1 to light them up about their bad behavior. That was going to destroy their relationships with each other, their relationships with their families, the relationships with God, and the relationship with church. So Paul is referring to his first letter to the Corinthians. The harsh letter, the confrontational letter, letter, the letter who confronted uh, that Paul confronted those he loved in love. Notice what he says. He says, "I wrote to you out of great distress, out of anguish of heart, and with many tears." You know what Paul is saying? That when I finished writing that first letter, I didn't say, "Boy, that feels good." Paul was saying, "Man." This might end my relationship with some people I love. And he was anxious over it, and he had tears over it, and he was worried about it. So make sure, number two, that your motives are right. Here's number three. Plan your confrontation lovingly. Plan your confrontation lovingly. Now, notice that word plan. I've told you before, don't go into this willy-nilly. Man, you got a plan. you got to think about it. Uh, man, every great relationship stands on kind of like a three-legged stool. There is love and there is affirmation, but when necessary, there has to be confrontation. If I ignore confrontation, and many people are non-confrontational people, and if love and affirmation ever begins to fall off, there's no third leg for me to say what you are doing is destroying you or it's destroying us or it's destroying your kids or it's destroying your parents or it's destroying your career. There's no leg to stand on. So as a loving relationship, whether it's in marriage or just a great friendship, Man, friends ought to lovingly and lo love each other, but they sometimes need to affirm each other. Man, you're awesome, but there are times that the best thing I can do is say, hey, I prayed long and hard about this, and I, I may even have tears in my eyes, but I need to talk to you about something. Anybody ever heard the statement, the truth will set you free? Let me add the rest of that phrase. The truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. Because if I am preparing to go confront someone in truth and in love, let me tell you what, you ought to be miserable. And if you are trying to confront someone you love in love and there's joy just bubbling out of your heart, you're probably not going with the right heart.
Paul says, man, through grief and affliction and tears, I wrote to you, and it hurt. So as you think about it, man, just confront them loving. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 23. Here's what it says. It says, the hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent. That's why you want to plan. Plan your confrontation. Well, write down the things that you should say and shouldn't say. Write down things that, man, they're probably more prone to hear me say this, and I don't want to add this. And it says, and their lips promote instruction. Why do you want to plan your confrontation? Because I want this confrontation to be one that promotes instruction and not pain. I don't want to roll in here guns a-blazing. I want to promote instruction and in everything I do as I plan my confrontation love and about all of these things. I want to make sure that I'm planning for the proper time that perhaps I would, it would lead to the most instruction and the most reception. Look at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. It says, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. What does that mean? A word, a judgment rightly given. I am here to lovingly judge your behavior as destructive and risky for you, for us, or those around us. And so I want you to know this is a right judgment. I, can, I, I plan it uh, lovingly. Now read on, verse 12. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge, listen to this, to a listening ear. That'll kind of help me determine when I want to go. When do I want to go and have a confrontation? When they have a listening ear. That may mean I need to think back, what is their time frame? What is their schedule? When should I go? Which brings me to my next idea. If you are going to go, and biblically here's the thought, you need to plan not only your conversation lovingly, but you need to plan what, when, and how you're going to say it. You need to get that detailed. If I'm going to confront uh, my spouse or someone I love, and I know, man, they wake up at 4.30 in the morning, probably wait until 10 p.m. at night is not the most productive time. How many of you know what I said? About the time you're both exhausted and you're laying your pillow on the head, or your head on the pillow, the pillow on the head. See, that's a different confrontation when you put the pillow on the head, <laughs> all right? That's, that's one I don't want to hear someone say to the news media, well, the pastor said I could do that, all right? When your head's on the pillow, that's not the time for a long, drawn-out discussion, all right? So you need to plan, man, when and what and how I'm going to say it. Here are a few thoughts. You might want to, uh, knots and thoughts. Don't start with sarcasm. Tell yourself, regardless of what is said, I'm not going to resort to cussing. Um, not right before dinner. I read an article this week that, that, that those whose marriages struggle the most have a tendency to fight right before meals. Why is that? Because you argue, you, you come home, you're stressed, she's stressed, all of those things. And then guess what? You get in a little argument right before meals. Man, put it off until after dinner. Guys, there's a very practical reason for that, too, because while dinner, she's making it, she could kill you. <laughs> you could say, hey, what's that taste? And she says, rat poisoning, enjoy. <laughs> Don't do it before dinner. Why? Because so many people destroy the dinner. The dinner time, that ought to be a meal time. That ought to be a, a time where we, we're conversing, we're talking to our kids. So listen, let it wait. Choose the right time. Choose the right space. Choose everything about it. Um, in the conversation, this is why I want to encourage you to write out what you're going to say. Try not to use the word but. That's with one T, not two. All right? Anybody ever come up to you? If anybody ever come up to you and say, you know what? I like you and you're fun and you're jovial and you're smiling. And, you know, you're really good at what you do here, but... What happens when someone does that to me? I want you to know, I will do this to you. I do it to you all the time. Here's what happens. When you come up and say, man, I love, I'm so glad you're my pastor and you do this and you're so sweet and you visited me in the hospital, but let me just tell you what my mind just did. It just inserted and deleted everything you just said. And it comes up as 
Bo Honkus. All right, that's from the oldest Old Testament. So try, to, and this is, this is easy, man. This, this, this is not easy. This is hard. Try to use the word and instead of but. Still a conjunction, all right? Say, you know what? I love you, and I'm glad we're married, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I've also got a few things that I want to talk to you about. You see, hear the difference, and and but. And let me tell you what, but's a lot easier. But will drive you to the point. But I will tell you, it will also, listen to this, it will also cause you, cause them just to, boy, I just know what's coming. It's not good. You've just changed the conversation. So write it out. Try to put the word and in there and, instead of, uh, but look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Proverbs 12, verse 18, what do you say? The words of, reckless, uh, of the reckless person pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What do I want to say? Things that bring healing. I want to write them in. I want to plan it out. I want to say things that bring healing. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 21. What do I want to say? How do I want to say it? All of those things. The wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. Now, say it tactfully, gently, gently and lovingly. Here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Look at what it says. He says, I'm writing these things not to shame you. Whatever you say, don't say it in a way to shame the other person. Do everything you can to build them up. Don't say it in such a way that you shame them. Do everything you can to lift them up, to build them up, to say it tactfully, to choose your words carefully, to choose your words cautiously, but then notice lovingly and gently. That word gently means I, I need to be careful. I don't need to come in both guns blazing, both barrels blazing. I don't need to come in there with fists swinging and hands. I, I don't need to be slobbering all over myself as I'm spewing out my confrontational words. I want to do it gently. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says, brothers and sisters, what is he saying? He's talking about those I love and those I have a relationship with. He says, if someone... If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. That word restore, you might want to circle it or make a note of it. It's an orthopedic term. It's an orthopedic term, and really in those days, if an athlete or someone uh, uh, dislocated a bone or broke a bone, that word restore means to put it back in place, to reset the joint, to reset the bone so it's in a proper healing and growing position. So when we go to confront someone we love in love, I'm going in there gently to restore them, not to deliver pain. Not to just shake them up and make the wound and the pain hurt that much more. I am looking to tactfully say words to restore them. Now, I want you to know this. There are no such things as perfect words in seasons like this. And if you think I'm going to wait until I can say it the perfect way, you'll never go. All you can have is a really, really prayerful, thought-out, anguished, tearful plan. And then you move by the Spirit, go to restore someone gently. Here's the last thought if you're talking about confronting someone you love, in love, and it's this. Beware of the risk of rejection. When you walk into this season, regardless of how prayed up and prepared and how tearful and how anxious and how loving you are, there is always the possibility someone is going to say, get out of my face. And if that's the case, just be aware. And make sure that you have weighed the risk. If I don't say anything, they're going to destroy themselves, they're going to destroy others, or they're going to destroy us. 
if I say something and they reject me. I need to be aware of those risks. I need to understand the game that I'm playing. And I want to say this again at the end, just as I said it at the beginning. If you are thinking about going this week and confronting someone, and if they blow your relationship up, it doesn't matter. You don't love them. And let's be honest. So I'm talking about confronting someone you love in love. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4? Look at it. He says, I've spoken to you with great frankness. In other words, Paul, what is he talking? He's going back to his first letter. Remember I told you his first letter was when he lit him up. But he lit him up through tears and anxiety and worry and sorrow and concern. So he says, I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take pride in you. I love you. What is he doing? He's loving them and affirming them. He's also acknowledging the fact, man, that was a hard word. That was a hard word. What I said to you was not an easy word for me to say, nor was it an easy word for you to hear. And then as you read on, he says what? I take great pride in you. He's affirming them, building them up. I am greatly encouraged in all your or in all our troubles, our, notice our, that's someone I have a relationship with, our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. In other words, through it all, I love you. I love this last passage, and we could pick it up, and, and here's the idea, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 11. Paul says what? Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it now, though, folks, I did regret it. I was worried. I was anxious. I see that my letter hurt you, but that's not what I'm joyful, but only for a little while. Now, listen to this. Yet now I am happy. Now I'm overjoyed, not because it made you sorry, but because your sorrow led to your repentance. When I think about confronting someone I love in love, the number one goal ought to be restoration and not destruction. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, I I do and I am as a pastor well aware that when I preach and I'm humbled as well as pained, When I preach a message like this, that there will be those and there are those that are listening online and in person who know they need to go have a hard conversation with someone they love. God, I pray for that individual now. God, beyond that, I I know there are those listening online and even in this location might be on the receiving end of a confrontation with someone they love. I pray that they immediately, God, with your spirit, you would remind their minds and their hearts that it was through much pain and much anguish this person who loves me has sat down before me to address my behaviors. God, my prayer for every person in this room is restoration, is healing, is sorrow that leads to repentant joyfulness in marriages, in relationship with kids, in friendships within our church, relationships within our community, relationships at the office so that we could be salt and we can be light. And God, as a church, let us be reminded again today as we leave that now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.